This episode is brought to you by the V1 Project. Before we dive into today's episode of the Lift Effect Podcast, I want to tell you about something that's really quite special to me. It's called the V1 Project, and it's all about bringing professional pilots together to create a supportive community. You know, being a pilot is more than just a job. It's a way of life. The V1 Project is here to help you cultivate a core set of values and virtues that will help you enhance not just your career, but all aspects of your life. Many of you have reached out and asked about the Lift Effect Mental Skills course for value-based living. While we're not offering that course right now as a standalone course, we have included it as the first four months of the V1 Project. So if you want to take that course, you got to go into the V1 Project to get it. But here's the thing. The V1 Project is not just about what you learn, it's about who you meet. It's all about building a strong sense of community. Picture yourself surrounded by like-minded individuals, all on a journey to better themselves and to support each other. Our motto says it all. V1 is a place for professional pilots to build community, cultivate and develop and express a core set of values and virtues for optimal living in a supportive community with encouragement and professional guidance. So if you're a professional pilot looking for something more, something that'll take your career and your life to the next level, head on over to the v1project.com. That's www.theve1 as in the number 1, not o n e, but 1 project.com. Join the V1 Project today and let's go. Hi everyone, welcome to a sneak peek of a premium episode of the Lift Effect podcast. I'm your host Matt McNeil, clinical director and director of human performance at Lift Effect. Our premium channel was created in order to provide support to the standard Lift Effect podcast, which comes out every Friday and is available at no cost to everyone on all standard podcast feeds, including YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Podbean, and elsewhere. If you'd like to subscribe to the premium channel of the Lift Effect podcast, please click on the link provided in the description section of this episode in your feed, or head over to lifteffect.supercast.com. Dot com. That's L-I-F-T-A-F-F-E-C-T dot S-U-P-E-R-C-A-S-T dot com. It's $10 a month to subscribe. For those of you that are already subscribers to the premium channel, please go to lifteffect.supercast.com and download the subscription feed. For those of you that are not subscribers of the Lift Effect premium feed, you can still hear the first 20 minutes of today's episode and determine whether or not becoming a premium subscriber is for you. At the end of this short episode, I'll explain how you can access the premium episodes in full, along with a host of other premium membership benefits we've created. So without further delay, here's today's sneak peek of the premium episode of the Lift Effect podcast. The views expressed herein are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Defense Health Agency, Brook Army Medical Center, the Department of Defense, nor any agencies under the U.S. government. Hello, ladies and gents. This is Matt McNeil welcoming you to another episode of the Lift Effect podcast, where we help pilots and other high liability professionals come out of the shadows by discussing various topics around mental health and mental performance with the ultimate aim of giving you strategies you can actually implement for improving all aspects of your personal and professional life. It might be an organizational tactic, or maybe just a simple mode of thinking that will translate. My guest today is William Hoffman, or Billy as we all know him. Billy is a neurologist and aeromedical researcher with an interest in pilot healthcare seeking behavior and aeromedical screening. He is an assistant professor of aerospace at the University of North Dakota John D. Odegaard School of Aerospace Science and has studied healthcare behavior of over 5,000 pilots across North America, which is a, a ton. He is an internationally invited speaker on pilot health with appearances on NBC, Fox News, and countless other outlets. He has publications in Scientific American, Flying Magazine, AOPA Magazine, and many other peer-reviewed scientific journals. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. William Hoffman. Billy, thank you for coming on our, our, our little train that could, the Lift Effect podcast. 
Matt, it's a long time coming, and I'm so excited to be with you, man. Who wouldn't want to talk about airplanes on a Friday afternoon? Right. I know. And that's, yes, let me add, this is a Friday afternoon after Billy has worked all day. He's probably been up since, I don't know, the crack of dawn. But he's here on his Friday afternoon, uh, but, but we're making it work. So I'm so excited to have you here. We almost got together when you were uh, in Colorado a few months ago skiing, uh, but you got stuck in like the tunnel or something. What, what was, this, what happened with that? I don't remember. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm learning, you know, I'm not a Colorado, you know, Colorado, a Colorado resident. So I'm learning that that road between the ski mountain and Denver gets clogged and you could be stuck there for like four hours. It's awful. Yeah. It's I, awful. I learned that the hard way. Pe- people quickly discover that anywhere outside of their car is a restroom. <laughs> <laughs> Were you seeing that? Were people well, just, well, yeah, when you're stuck for four hours, what are you supposed to do? I mean, yeah, you know, desperate times, you know? <laughs> desperate times. Were you stuck in a blizzard? Or did, the, did it, it was just bumper to bumper shut down? Yeah, they closed that. I guess there's some tunnel that goes through a mountain that they had. Eisenhower closed. Tunnel. Was, yep, somebody yeah. somebody bumped into somebody else. And before you know it, we had a little, uh, you know, a little detour on the highway. But um, it, all, it all worked out okay. So that, yeah. I guess that's what you get for trying to ski. I know. We almost made it. We were going to get together, and then it just didn't happen, but but that's okay. We're getting together today. So we're here. There's so much to talk about. Uh, I think because... So a couple things. I want to I want to talk about some of these studies, um, and I really want to introduce... The, the world knows Billy Hoffman. They're getting to know you, but some I'm sure a lot of pilots um, are not aware of of who you are and the pretty incredible work that you're doing. Um, But before we get into the research stuff, since Lift Effect is about uh, people, that's what we're about. We're about, we're pilots, we're real people. We have our own stories. We have our own struggles. We have our own strengths, our own weaknesses. I think um, I would love for just people just to get to know a little bit about you and how you got into this whole mess of pilots (laughs) pilots <laughs> and <laughs> and healthcare and medicine and all that where how did you get involved in this what where did it start because i think now you are a pilot uh you're a licensed uh private pilot right yep just for you fun went to though, UND, just, for fun. just for fun yeah <laughs> just for fun you went to und yep, as an undergrad. undergrad yeah exactly what was that about how did that yeah. how did that start where <laughs> well, you from, where did you even grow up yeah, I don't think I know that. Well, let me start by saying you're blowing up a lot of smoke, and I and I appreciate it. But uh, you know, I'm just Billy, and uh, I'm just your run of the mill <laughs> guy taking care of patients, slugging it in the clinic, um, and loves airplanes. So mm-hmm. I, I appreciate all your kind words, but you know, uh, I, I I like to think I'm a member of the team here, and uh, really, what this is all about is being around airplanes for me and taking mm-hmm. care of our, our patients and other people like me who love airplanes. So that's what this is all about for me. But um, well, yeah, you're, you're yeah. humble. <laughs> Well, you know, from Minnesota, went to UND, uh, started as a commercial aviation major. And it's so funny how life works. I, I serendipitously took the wrong biology course. And I, I was a commercial <laughs> aviation major. And I was loving this bio course. And I'm like, man. So I did in the second semester. I took the second semester. And I had this very much a come to Jesus moment. you know. And I remember my dad saying, you know, Bill, you can be a pilot. and You can be a doctor and be a pilot. But you can't be a pilot and be a doctor. So <laughs> I, I jumped ship with a lot of heartache and um, with a love for aviation and definitely an eye skyward. But it has been such an, a wonderful privilege to try to carve a small space in meeting a, what is clearly a big need, uh, taking care of our pilot patients, helping this unique, really unique patient population meet their health care needs. And it's just been a wonderful journey. And it's a huge privilege. But that's kind of how I got here. So you just like ended up in the wrong biology class. What what turned you on about biology? That was like psychology for me. It was like something happened when I took, I think it was abnormal psych. It was like something lit up that just was unstoppable. But what what, what happened with the bio thing? What turned you on about with, with, with biology? I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, and, you know, we, I feel like we need to crack a beer, right? Because it's like we're getting real <laughs> yeah. existential here. But Yeah, why not? <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I mean, there's something that's in, I'm a neurologist, right? There's just something that is so satisfying, you know, studying the computer that makes us perceive the world. You know, there's this idea that 
what reality is and what reality isn't. But as we experience mm. different neurological conditions, our perception of reality changes. And who are we to go to somebody who's got some different neurocircuitry of their brain and saying that's abnormal or that's not mm. real? Well, what is real? Our brain is creating a map of the world around us that we are, we are using to interpret and we're you know, determining what the norm is and comparing it to that. Um, so I love it's It's been a wonderful uh, experience to merge the science, the hard science with a lot of the humanism, which is, you know, that's the yeah. beauty of medicine, that science and art merging it together and, and in the end helping people, which is just a, it's, it's a lot of fun. It could be sometimes a little bit of a slog. That's every job. But um, in the end, hopefully we help more people than, uh, than, than not. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the brain, I, I always tell people, you know, I tell my clients, my patients, like your brain is the most complicated ecosystem and machine in the universe and we got more neurons in our head than there are stars in the galaxy and like what we know is like the tip of the the pen about about how this incredible uh beautiful machine works uh so to try to you know i think as pilots we like to try to see things as just kind of black and white and then when when things happen that is not what we're expecting, especially when it's something psychological, uh, we tend to think, okay, there's something wrong with me. And that's perpetuated, I think, quite a bit within just even sort of the, the, the medical system of what is right, what is wrong, you know, the DSM, and here's these symptoms and you get these diagnoses, but it's such a, a, a stupidly simplistic understanding of this really complicated uh, machine. It... It, it's humbling. And we, you know, us naive humans trying to put everything in buckets and trying to categorize everything uh, and dichotomous, yes, no, normal, abnormal, but it's just not that simple. And it, it's just a beautifully fascinating place to study and learn and help people. And most of the time in clinic, I almost start, I start most of my visits with, you know what the reality is? This is all on a continuum. There's nothing dichotomous here. Um, and we, yeah. we, we know less than we think we know. Um, and, uh, and that's okay. You know, it's kind of building a partnership at the, at the, at the edge of science for a lot of these conditions. And it's, it's, it's really, it's really wonderful. Um, and helping patients navigate that. And like, how do you, how do you live with these things and what does living look like, uh, you know, despite these things, which is really amazing, but, um, you know, and, and you, you mentioned like things being normal, abnormal, you know, we in neurology, a stroke is easy, right? You can point to it, this is abnormal on the brain. You got weakness. It's from this. This is a hardware issue. It's much harder when it's a software issue. Yes. And this is the, the metaverse of the brain, right? This is the infin, uh, infinite number of combinations of networks firing in different you know, patterns that allows us to perceive the world, allows us to think, allows us to have feelings, you know, perceive emotion. And what's so interesting is that that is so influenced by our world. And that's why I so respect what you're doing here is sleep mindfulness, nutrition. Yeah. Um, and how do we, how do we help take control of those cir the circuits that allows us to, uh, to change that thinking? Um, you know, things that fire together, wire together, and you're a big way of, of helping people rewire that, which is just incredible. Well, and the fact that we can rewire is, I think the, that, that part is what really, you know, kind of blew me away. I think in undergrad was I started to understand that you this idea that it, it look and back when i was you know back when i was in undergrad <laughs> long time ago um i see in, the gray hairs the, up there man the mid 90s yeah um <laughs> mid 90s i was an undergrad uh and it was still like this kind of idea that that you had fixed number of brain cells and every time you go out drinking uh, at the Paradise Lounge for buck 25 rail drinks on Tuesday nights. Not that I ever did that. They said, you know, you never get those brain cells back. That was the idea. And then mm. I remember reading a couple of studies that were showing this idea um, of neuroplasticity. And like that was like that kind of blew that blew mm. the, the barn doors open for me. And then years, you know, decade later, uh, when I went back for a clinical graduate degree, um, then all of the thinking and where I studied at University of Wisconsin Madison, they were doing uh, research on um, neurogenesis, which is actually adding physical mass to the brain. So it was not only just 
reprogramming the software, but you, you know, you can actually add hardware to the prefrontal cortex with things like mindfulness and, and like that was, I mean, that just, I get so excited <laughs> about that. I mean, it's crazy. The, the thing that is so beautiful is, you know, neurology is a really special in, field because of the hard science, the medical humanities part, but also the medical history part. You know, thousands of years ago, we knew that we could control the brain, right? That, um, you know, things like mindfulness, yoga, meditation, these are using conscious control of your lower structures, your amygdala, your hypothalamus, your deep gray matter structures, that by focusing on those, focusing on the breath, that is using basically top-down control to change your heart rate, change your stress response. You know, that's like a bottom-up approach. If you think about we're controlling yep. the bottom stuff to control up. And then, you know, the other way is like cognitive behavioral therapy, using talk therapy, using how do we, you know, conceptualizing our emotion and how we relate to an emotion is kind of a top down. That's using your prefrontal cortex to control going down too. So it's a, it's a really interesting and special science and one that you are really tapping in on to meet this really amazing patient population's need. It's a, and it's a population that we need, we need the brain working at, at full speed how we can. And this is a big tool to, uh, to help, you know, to help prepare ourselves for the circumstance that we need all, all neurons firing together. <laughs> <laughs> Huge Actually, tool. Not indeed. together. That's a seizure in the prop, in the <laughs> no, proper no. combination, right? <laughs> that's right. There you go. <laughs> the right sequence, the right, right sequence. So, okay. So like, all right, you go through undergrad, you do the whole bio core, uh, thing, right? You get into medical school. Where'd you, where'd you do your medical school? Uh, Georgetown University School of Medicine in Washington. Yep. And how was that? What was that like? Besides a lot of <laughs> a lot of memorization, <laughs> a, man. A little bit a of a grind. Of, a little bit of grind. It was a bit of a, just a little bit of a grind. <laughs> but was it good? Did you know you wanted to do neurology? Or like, how did that come about? Yeah. Well, the you thing did. that's so funny is, you know, you had mentioned, how, how the heck did I get into aerospace medicine research, right? Aerospace medicine is, neurology is a very small specialty in medicine, very small. Aerospace medicine is an even smaller one. Aerospace neurology, I think there's probably fewer than 10, like, right. anywhere. I mean, it's a very right. small niche field, which is, which is cool. Um, but when I, was at, when I was at UND, um, my best friend, and, and still is my best friend, um, he was an airline, you know, commercial aviation major, and, you know, we didn't know um, he was suffering um, and, you know, he was actually about ready to graduate and, you know, his family was all flying up from around the country and he didn't tell them he wasn't graduating the next day. In fact, he was like 18 months behind in his flying courses and he just, he, he wasn't ready to share that. And, um, you know, long story short, he got the help he needed. He's doing amazing and he's just rocking the world. But it just became so clear that there is this obvious barrier that pilots face in seeking medical care. And as a medical student at Georgetown, I was like, there's got to be stuff in the medical literature about this. And I was just absolutely blown away to find that even though we all joke, they, they just published an article in Air and Space magazine. It's titled Lie to Fly. We joke about it. But up until a couple of years ago, there was almost nothing in the medical literature to, to quantify that. And that's how this honestly all started several years ago. You know, if this happened in my life, this must be happening in other people's lives. And that has led to this, you know, what we've been going on. I don't even know now, six, seven years. We've studied 5,000 pilots uh, in North America. We got another study launching in two other countries um, that has, you know, while some people saying it's an obvious thing, sometimes it takes a fresh set of eyes, maybe some Joe Schmo neurologist in San Antonio to say, you know, there's something, there's an opportunity to improve a problem that maybe we've been accepting for too long. I, I totally agree. And let's, we'll get into, let's get into some of that. But before, so just so I understand the thread. So you go to medical school, you're not in the military at the time. You could have just gone into just the regular civilian route. You chose mil what, what was the, the impetus for that? Yeah, well, I joke around. Well, first and foremost, I love being in the Air Force. And the Air Force has been so good to me because they have given me the place to take care of patients, but also do this research. And uh, I've had this mm -hmm. excellent, wonderful leadership and mentorship. And it's just been a really wonderful, privileged journey for sure. But I did ROTC in undergrad at UND. 
Uh, and then the Air Force sent me to med school um, and then residency and fellowship. And um, and so I owe the Air Force a lot of time. But you know what? I'm very happy about it because uh, it's, a, it's an amazing place to take care of a really a wonderful population of patients. And that is our active duty military members, their dependents, our retirees. Um, it's, it's a huge privilege. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so the pilots, so you, you focus your research now. Let's, let, let's, should we get into the research? Let's talk do it. it. Hey, let's talk numbers. Let's get the people oh. going and talk numbers. <laughs> well, let, I've got your studies pulled up. Which one? Should, like, let's delve in. Where where should we start? Which you choose? Because you've done you've done a lot. Um, there's a lot here. Pick one. What should we talk about? Which one? Where should we start? Well, let's start with the big number, and okay. uh, and that number is: Do pilots participate in healthcare avoidance? Mm -hmm. Now, maybe some people are saying, of course, right? Um, but what became clear early on was for us to really talk about something that from a clinical perspective, and in, in the clinic, I see this, right, with patients. And I know you do too, Matt, and I know a lot of people do, that, you know, we all talk about this phenomena where pilots are hesitant to see, disclose health information, hesitant to seek health care, delay or forego medical care. But um, what became clear is that we need a number to try to quantify the prevalence. What's the epidemiology of healthcare avoidance? And that's what we try to set out to do. And this was a huge project made possible thanks to many, many people um, that we were able to recruit over 4,000 pilots across the United States. To our knowledge, the, the largest study on healthcare avoidance, really asking the obvious question. Have you ever... Uh, uh, participate in some form of healthcare avoidance, and we have a kind of a definition for that, because of your fear of losing your certificate. And, uh, you know, in this study, you know, we found that just over 50% of pilots reported yes, a 50 50 shot. Now, while that number, um, you know, may not be that surprising to some people, to our knowledge, that was one of the first numbers trying to quantify it, but a very important point. There was a whole slew of people that in the, in, the, in the study that either didn't answer the question or they answered prefer not to answer. And to be as conservative as possible, we categorized all of those responders as no. So those are just the people that disclosed yes. And I will, I will leave the interpretation of a prefer not to answer or a no answer up to the audience and what that might mean. So that was that first big paper that came out and everything has kind of spiraled out of that. Do you know, how does that compare with just a selection of the general population? Just regular, do, do, do people avoid healthcare just in general? Or, I mean, I know we're talking about pilots here. Do we know what the data is on that? Just general healthcare avoidance? The thing that's, that makes that question so challenging is that, you know, there are, you know, if, if you look at the, for example, the, the population of airline pilots, now there are absolutely caveats and there's, there's, this is not true for everybody, but many airline pilots have, you know, some degree of healthcare literacy. Many pilots have some some access to healthcare through health insurers. Maybe some of them have paid time off. In you know, for as studying a population, it's it's compared to the general population, relatively homogeneous. That in the general population, it's much more heterogeneous. Um, you know, geographic location, whether or not they have um, health insurance, do they have paid time off? whether you're a salaried employee versus an hourly employee. So um, it, it's hard to, in, you know, in looking at some of the data early on, it's hard to really extrapolate data from the general population, apply it to pilots, because really it's such a unique, it's a unique situation. And if, of course, after German Wings, uh, there was the, uh, there was the ARC, um, which was this committee established by the FAA to, what do we do next? How do we address mental health in aviation? And um, I was actually just reading that the other day, preparing for a presentation, and they talk about healthcare avoidance in that article. And the thing that blew me away was they were citing, well, one, there, there were really no papers at that time to cite to quantify healthcare avoidance in pilots. And two, um, they're, you know, they're citing the general population, which, you know, you try your best with what you have at the time, but the, the data around this is, is quickly evolving. And we hope to use that as a tool to help meet the needs of our patients. So one in let's just I'm just kind of looking at at some of the studies breaking the pilot healthcare barrier that paper, um, one of the things that the study says or in the in the article um, it says 
so there's multiple psychosocial factors in the framework defined as factors that influence decision making of planned or intended health behavior could provide partial explanation for these findings. Um, so some of the things you cite in there is like attitudes of pilots. Um, let's talk about that. Perceived likelihood of re, uh, of regaining or uh, an aeromedical certificate once lost. What are, what have you found the attitudes around having a health a, a, a health issue that could impact your certificate? What are the attitudes you find with pilots? I can tell you clinically what mine are, but I'm just curious what you're finding from your your position. Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek premium episode of the Lift Effect podcast. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this episode, you'll want to become a member. We've created the membership program to bring you more in-depth, exclusive content without relying on paid ads. Membership benefits are many beyond the complete episodes of the premium shows each month. They include podcast show notes that provide relevant notes and links to what we discuss during each episode, complete transcripts of each episode of the standard and premium episodes of the Lift Effect podcast, access to our private podcast feed, the ability to ask questions that we will answer on the regular feed of the Lift Effect podcast, regular and ad-free episodes of the regular and premium feeds, and benefits that we will continue to add over time. If you want to learn more, head over to lifteffect.supercast.com. Lastly, if you're already a member and are hearing this, it means that you haven't downloaded our member-only podcast feed where you can get the full access to the podcast and you don't have to listen to this. You can download that at lifteffect.supercast.com. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Lift Effect Podcast. If you want to dive deeper into this episode and every episode, go to our website, lifteffect.com forward slash podcast. If you're enjoying the show, we would love it if you'd follow us on Spotify and rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate your support. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, all with the ID Matthew McNeil. This show is brought to you by Lift Effect a clinical mental health and consulting company that assists air carriers, corporate flight departments, pilot unions, and commercial pilots by providing comprehensive psychotherapy and mental skills coaching services to pilots with mental health and mental performance related issues. Visit lifteffect.com, that's L-I-F-T-A-F-F-E-C-T.com to book your free consultation. And finally, this podcast is for general informational purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of counseling, psychotherapy, medicine, or any other health care service, including the giving of medical advice. No therapeutic or provider-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and any materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional psychological advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining advice for any psychological or medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on the Lift Effect podcast.